Thank you very much. Thanks, Aditi, for that kind introduction. This is going to be a talk about quantum physics and also about information, quantum information. We all recognize that information technologies today have changed our lives, but at the same time, recognize that technology that may seem impressive to us today is going to be replaced in the future by new technology that we really can't expect to imagine today. It's kind of fun to speculate about future technology. I may not be the ideal person to engage in that kind of speculation. I'm not an engineer. I'm a theoretical physicist and maybe not deeply knowledgeable about how computers really work. But as a physicist, I know without hesitation that the crowning intellectual achievement of the 20th century was the development of the quantum theory. And it's natural to wonder how the development of quantum theory in the 20th century will impact 21st century technologies. Quantum theory is a rather old subject by now, but some of the important ways in which quantum and classical systems differ from one another we've only begun to appreciate relatively recently, and a lot of those differences have to do with the properties of information encoded in physical systems. To a physicist, information is something we can record and store in the state of some physical system, like the pages of a book. But fundamentally, all physical systems are quantum systems governed by quantum mechanics, and so information is something we can encode and store in a quantum state. And physicists have appreciated for a long time that information carried by quantum systems can have some counterintuitive properties. That's why we like to speak about the weirdness of quantum theory, and we relish that weirdness, but we're also taking more seriously lately the idea that we might put the weirdness to work to exploit unusual properties of quantum information to perform tasks that wouldn't be possible if this were a less weird classical world. And that drive to put weirdness to work has given rise to a field of science we call quantum information science, which derives a lot of its intellectual vitality from three main ideas quantum entanglement, quantum computing, and quantum error correction. And my goal today is to explain these ideas. So let's start at the beginning. You know that any amount of classical information can be expressed in terms of indivisible units of information, bits, where we can think of a bit as an object, like let's say a ball, which can be either one of two colors. And because a bit is something of value, I like storing my bits and I can put a bit inside a box and then later on if I open the box again the colored ball that I put in comes out again so I can recover a bit and read it. Quantum information, information carried by quantum systems can also be expressed in terms of indivisible units what we call qubits or quantum bits and for many purposes it's convenient to think of a qubit as a colored ball stored inside a box, 
but where now we can open the box in either one of two complementary ways, through either door number one or door number two. So I can put information in the box through either door number one or door number two, and then later on if I open the same door again, then the colored ball that I come, put in comes out of the box. But if, on the other hand, I store information in the box by putting the ball through door number one, and then later on do open the complementary door, door number two, then what comes out of the box is just a random color with a 50% probability of being red and 50% probability of being green. So if you want to read the quantum information, you have to do it the right way. If you do it the wrong way, then you will necessarily damage the information. And that feature has consequences we can appreciate if we think about copying quantum states. If I had a quantum copy machine, that would mean that if I happened to uh, put information through door number one of the qubit, I could make a copy and then open door number one on the original and the copy and the color ball that I put in would come out of both boxes. And if, on the other hand, I had put information in door number two of the box and made a copy, then I could open door number two on the original and the duplicate and the color I put in would come out of both boxes. But in fact, no such machine is physically possible. A quantum copy machine, which can copy unknown quantum states, is inconsistent with the principles of quantum theory. And the reason why is that in order to make the copy, the device would have to probe inside the box. And if it guesses right and opens the door that I use, then it would be able to copy the information just as though it were classical. But if it guesses wrong and opens the other door, then it will damage the information and there will be no way to build a high fidelity copy. So we might be able to clone a sheep, but we can't clone a qubit. Now, as you can see, I like to think about qubits in kind of an abstract way, but a qubit is a physical object and it has always some physical realization. If you want to have something concrete to keep in mind, here's an example, and I'll mention some other examples later in the talk. I can imagine a single photon, a particle of light, it has a polarization, an electric field, which I can choose to be pointing either horizontally or vertically, corresponding to the two colored balls I could see when I look at the photon through door number one. Or I consider the polarization states that are rotated 45 degrees, corresponding to opening the photon through door number two. So if I prepare, say, a horizontally polarized photon and then measure the polarization along the tilted axes, I can get either one of the two outcomes, each with probability one-half. The really interesting ways in which quantum information is different from classical information can only be appreciated if we consider states of more than one qubit. So let's suppose we have two, and they can be far apart from one another. I can have one at Caltech in Pasadena, the other in, a cus in the custody of my friend in the Andromeda galaxy. And some time ago, these two qubits were both on Earth, and interacted in some way so that they were prepared in a state which has some interesting properties. Namely, I can open my box through either door number one or door number two in Pasadena, and either way what I find is just a random bit. It has probability one-half of being red and probability one-half of being green. And the same thing is true for my friend in Andromeda. He can open either door number one or door number two, and either way he just finds a random bit. So neither one of us, by opening our boxes, was able to learn anything about the content of the box. We just generated it a random bit. And that seems peculiar because with two qubits, we should be able to store two bits of information. Where is that information hidden? The answer in this case is that all the information is actually encoded in the correlations between what happens when you open a box in Pasadena and you open a box in Andromeda. Because it turns out for this particular state of the two qubits that if my friend and I both open door number one, we're guaranteed to find the same color. It might be red or it might be green, but if we open the same door, we see the same thing. And that's also true if we both open door number two. It could be red or it could be green, but if we both open door number two, we're guaranteed to find the same color. And there are four distinguishable ways in which a qubit and Pasadena could be correlated with a qubit in Andromeda. We could either see the same color or different colors when we both open door number one or when we both open door number two. 
And by choosing one of those four possibilities, we've encoded two bits of information in the pair of boxes. But what's unusual is that information is not locally accessible in either Pasadena or in Andromeda. It is equally shared by these two distantly separated qubits. How, sorry? You can only check the correlated in one direction, right? You can't check correlations. That's right. So what I have to do to verify that the correlations are as I described is prepare the same state of the two qubits a million times. And half a million times we both open door number one, and half a million times we both open door number two, and we find a perfect correlation every time. And that's how we know the state has the property I described. With a single copy, we can't verify it the way I described. That feature that the information can be encoded non-locally, shared by the distantly separated qubits, is what we call quantum entanglement. And it's the really interesting way in which quantum information differs from classical information. Now, correlations themselves are not unusual. We encounter those all the time in daily life. Normally, I wear socks which are the same color, and that means if you look at my left foot, you know, without looking, what color sock to expect to find on my right foot, because the socks are correlated. And it's kind of the same with the qubits. If I want to know what my friend in Andromeda is going to see when he opens door number one in Andromeda, I can open door number one in Pasadena to find out. And if I want to know what my friend is going to see when he opens door number two in Andromeda, I open door number two in Pasadena. So it may seem that the boxes are really just like the Soxes, but in fact I claim they're fundamentally different. These quantum correlations are different from classical ones, and the essence of the difference is there's just one way to look at a sock, but we have these two complementary ways of looking at qubits, and that makes the correlations among qubits richer and a lot more interesting than correlations among classical bits. Now, this phenomenon of quantum entanglement was first explicitly discussed by Einstein and collaborators a long time ago, 80 years ago. And to Einstein, quantum entanglement was so unsettling as to indicate that there's something missing from our current understanding of the quantum description of nature. And that paper elicited some interesting responses, including a particularly insightful one by Schrodinger, who described the situation by saying the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of its parts. And what Schrodinger meant is that even if we know everything about how I prepared the state of those two qubits, we're still helpless to predict what will be found when we open one of the boxes, either in Pasadena or in Andromeda. And it was Schrodinger who suggested that we use the word entanglement to describe these unusual correlations. And he added, it is rather discomforting that the theory should allow a system to be steered or piloted into one or the other type of state at the experimenter's mercy in spite of his having no access to it. And what Schrodinger meant is that it seems peculiar that it's up to me to decide by opening either door number one or door number two in Pasadena, whether I will know what my friend will find when he opens either door number one or door number two. But Schrodinger understood that these correlations, though different from classical ones, do not allow instantaneous communication between Pasadena and Andromeda, because no matter whether I open door number one or door number two, when my friend opens his door in Andromeda, he'll just find a random bit, whether he opens door number one or door number two, and what he finds does not depend on which box I chose to open, even though our results are correlated. So this idea of quantum entanglement did not advance very much for the next 30 years until the work of John Bell in the 1960s. And starting with Bell, we began to think about entanglement in a different way, not just as something strange about quantum theory, but as something potentially useful as a resource that we can use to do things. Bell described games that two players can play, cooperative games where Alice and Bob are both on the same side trying to help one another win. And these games have this kind of structure. Alice and Bob receive inputs and they are then supposed to produce outputs which are correlated in some way that depends on the inputs that they receive. 
But the rules of the game are such that Alice and Bob are not allowed to communicate with one another between when they receive their inputs and when they produce their outputs. And for this particular version of the game, if Alice and Bob play the best possible strategy, they can win the game, successfully produce the right correlation of their outputs with a probability of three quarters if we average uniformly over the inputs they could receive. But there's also a quantum version of the game. And in the quantum version, the rules are exactly the same, except that in the classical uh, version of the game, while Alice and Bob are allowed to use correlated bits that might have been distributed to them before the game began, in the quantum version, they can use correlated qubits, entangled qubits instead. And with those entangled qubits, they can play a better quantum strategy and win the game with a higher success probability, a little better than 85% instead of 75%. And experimentalists have been playing this game now for decades and winning with a higher probability of success, which Bell pointed out is possible in a quantum world, but not in a classical one. So it seems these unusual correlations really are part of nature's design. Einstein had derided quantum entanglement, calling it spooky action at a distance, which sounds especially derisive when you say it in German. <laughs> but you know, it doesn't even matter what Einstein thinks, whether he likes it or not. Nature is the way experiments reveal her to be, and we should learn to love her as she is. So I insist that the boxes really are not like the Soxes. These quantum correlations are different from classical ones. You can win a game with a probability of 85% instead of 75%. So is that really such a big deal? Yes, yes, it really is a big deal. And we can begin to appreciate why it's a big deal if we start thinking about systems with many parts instead of just two parts. Imagine a book which is 100 pages long. And if this were a classical book, I could read a single one of the pages and then I would know 1% of the content of the book, read another page and learn another 1% of the information content of the book and so on. But suppose it's a quantum book written in qubits instead of bits. And if this is a highly entangled quantum book, then if I look at the pages one at a time, all I see is random gibberish. I acquire no information that distinguishes one highly entangled book from another. And that's because the information isn't actually printed on the individual pages. The information in a highly entangled quantum book is recorded almost entirely in how the pages are correlated with one another. And I have to do a complicated collective observation of many pages at once to read the book. It turns out with a modest number of qubits in a highly entangled state, if I wanted to write down a complete description of all the ways in which these qubits are correlated with one another, if I open the different doors, measure different complementary observables, giving a complete description of all the correlations would require writing down more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it's never going to be possible, even in principle, to write down a complete description of that quantum state of just a few hundred qubits in terms of classical information. And that feature of the quantum world was very intriguing to Richard Feynman. It led him to make the suggestion in the early 1980s that perhaps if we build a computer, a quantum computer that processes qubits instead of classical bits, it would be able to perform tasks that are beyond the capability of any conceivable classical computer. What Feynman had in mind is that if we can't even express the state of a few hundred qubits in terms of classical information, then by processing the qubits, we ought to be able to perform tasks that could not be emulated by any classical device. And around the time Feynman was making this suggestion, there was an undergraduate student studying mathematics at Caltech. Like all Caltech students, he had to study quantum physics, like it or not. Like many Caltech students, he retained much of what he learned and put it to use a few years later in making a remarkable discovery. Shor considered the problem of factoring large integers, which we believe is a difficult problem for digital computers. But Shor showed that if we had a quantum computer, it would become an easy problem, not much harder together than multiplying numbers to not much harder to solve than multiplying numbers together to find their product. 
And when I heard about this in 1994, I was really awestruck because I realized that this meant the difference between hard and easy problems, the boundary between the problems that we won't be able to solve because they're too hard and the problems that we'll be able to solve someday with advanced technologies, is different than it otherwise would be because this is a quantum world, not a classical world. There's a question? Yes, but do we really know that it's hard? We do not really know that the question is, do we really know factoring is hard classically? There is no proof of the hardness of factoring, so it, it may turn out to be a classically easy problem. Our belief that it is hard is based in part on experience that a lot of very smart people have been working hard for decades to solve it, and there are still no good algorithms for factoring. There is a sub-exponential algorithm, but nevertheless, the speed-up is very substantial. If you compare Shor's algorithm to the best digital ones, um, an example of a factoring problem we can solve, it was done some years ago now, is factoring 193 digits, and that was done by a network of a few hundred workstations collaborating over the internet, and it took several months, and from what we know about the scaling of those best classical algorithms for factoring, if we use that same hardware to try to factor a number which is 500 digits long, it would take longer than the age of the universe. But now imagine that we have a quantum computer, we have to imagine it because we don't have it yet, which has the same clock speed as that classical system, can perform the same number of elementary operations per second as the classical computer can, then it would factor the 193-digit number in a tenth of a second and the 500-digit number in two seconds. So the resources that you need to solve the problem scale in a completely different way if we use a quantum algorithm instead of a classical one. Now, does anybody care whether factoring is a hard problem or an easy problem? Actually, people do because the public key crypto systems that we routinely use to protect our privacy these days when we communicate over the internet are based on the presumed hardness of factoring and other related number of theoretic problems and if in a few decades from now quantum computers are widely available we won't be able to use that method to protect our privacy alternatives exist but it's still not obvious what will be the best way to protect our privacy in a post quantum world but I would say from a broader perspective, the important thing that we learned, or apparently learned from Shore, is that there's an interesting classification of problems. There exist problems which seem to be quantumly easy, which we can solve with reasonable resources with quantum computers, but which are classically hard. And it becomes a kind of compelling question to understand what problems are in that class of intermediate difficulty. And we've learned some things about that. An important thing that we think we've learned is that quantum computers do have limitations. They can't speed up everything with the kind of sensational improvement I described for the factoring algorithm. And in particular, we don't expect spectacular quantum speed ups for the problems we call NP hard. Those are the problems which are the hardest ones whose solution we can easily check with a classical computer. In worst case instances, we can't do much better than an exhaustive search for the solution to these NP hard problems. And a quantum computer can speed up exhaustive search, but not nearly as dramatically as it speeds up factoring. On the other hand, quantum computers will have important applications which are outside this NP class. They can solve problems that we can't easily check the solution with a classical computer. And perhaps the most natural application, which was the point that Feynman emphasized, for a quantum computer is simulating the time evolution of quantum systems, which I could apply, for example, to studying chemical reactions or problems in quantum field theory. So in fact, an example of a problem which we think is hard quantumly in hard instances is simulating time evolution in many body quantum physics or quantum field theory. We have classical methods which work well at weak coupling but we think the problem becomes hard in general in strongly coupled theories. And recent work has indicated that with a quantum computer we could, for example, compute cross-sections for scattering in a strongly interacting quantum field theory with resources that scale reasonably with the size of the input to the problem, like the number of particles and the total energy of the process. And we think classically 
that's hard. What's still not clear is whether a quantum computer will be capable of efficiently simulating all processes that occur in nature. It's particularly intriguing to ask whether quantum computers will be able to simulate quantum gravity. We don't understand quantum gravity well enough to answer that question definitively. But either answer would be very interesting. If we can simulate quantum gravity when fluctuations in space-time are large with quantum computers, for physicists that will be a very interesting application. If we cannot, that means our current understanding of quantum computing has not fully embraced the computational power embedded in the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Do we know enough to pose the question precisely? Well, we're getting there. Um, so in particular, um, there is a formulation of quantum gravity which is non-perturbative, which can be applied to asymptotically anti-de-sitter spacetimes, the holographic duality formulation, where questions about quantum gravity can be translated into questions about quantum field theory. But we don't yet have a good enough handle on the trade-off between the field theory description and the gravity description to know exactly how to do the resource accounting for such problems. But people are convinced that the question is well, well defined, that the right question as formulated with this, this uh, CDF duality? I think there is, I, th I think you can make a good argument that uh, it's a well formulated question. However, there are many caveats. So one being, we don't really understand currently how to describe physics behind a black hole horizon using this holographic duality. So quantum computers would be great, and I'd really like to have one, and I don't. And so what's taking so long? We've been excited about quantum computing. I personally have been excited about it for 20 years. After hearing about Shor's algorithm, I got so interested that I eventually changed the direction of my own research from particle physics to quantum computing. Well, developing quantum computers is really, really hard. And part of what makes it hard is the problem of errors, the problem of decoherence. Physicists like to speak of a quantum superposition of the live and dead state of a cat, and we never experience in our everyday lives that type of superposition of macroscopically distinguishable states. And we understand why that's the case. It's because no real cat can be perfectly isolated from its surroundings and interactions with the environment in effect measure the cat projecting it onto a state which is either completely alive or completely dead. And that phenomenon of decoherence is really important for helping us to understand why although quantum mechanics holds sway at the level of microscopic systems, classical physics can be used to accurately describe most phenomena in the macroscopic world. A quantum computer won't be much like a cat but it will be a complex macroscopic quantum system and like the cat it will interact with its surroundings and that can drive decoherence causing errors in our computation. So we won't be able to operate large quantum computers successfully unless we can fight off the damaging effects of decoherence and the other potential sources of error in a quantum computer. Now errors can be a problem even in the classical world. We all have bits that we cherish, but there are always dragons threatening to tamper with our bits, changing the color of our balls. But in the classical world, we have learned to fend off the dragons. If I have a bit that I cherish, I can, for example, store backup copies of the bit, and then if one of those bits happens to get damaged by the dragon, I can employ a busy beaver who frequently checks the balls to see if one has become a different color than the other two, and then he immediately repaints the ball so that if the dragon hasn't had a chance to damage two out of the three bits, I can protect the information because it's been redundantly stored. 
And we'd like to use the same idea that redundancy allows us to protect information against damage in the quantum world, but we encounter subtleties. For one thing, as already mentioned, we can't copy unknown quantum states, so I can't just store a backup copy of a quantum state in case the original gets damaged. And we have more to worry about in the form of quantum errors than classical ones. It might be that the dragon opens door number one of a qubit and changes its color and recloses the box. That would be like a bit flip error that occurs in a classical system. But it might, on the other hand, open door number two and change the color of the ball and reclose the box. That's what we call a phase error in a quantum state which has no classical analog, and if we want to protect quantum information, we have to protect it against both bit flips and phase errors. There's another way of thinking about these phase errors. What might happen instead is that the dragon could open door number one, and instead of flipping the color of the ball, merely observe the color and remember it before reclosing the box, and that would have the effect of altering what I'll find if I open door number two of the box. And because it's, in many physical situations, easier to remember the value of a qubit than to flip its value, these phase errors are a particularly pervasive problem in a lot of physical systems. We need to be able to protect against them. So really the key is that when we look at quantum states, we damage them. If we want to resist decoherence, we have to prevent the environment from looking at the state, from learning about the state of the quantum computer. We have to isolate it from the outside world. If we successfully do a quantum computation, and then later ask the quantum computer what it was doing in the middle of the computation, it should always answer by saying, I forget, because no information should be left behind about the intermediate states of the computation before we got the final answer. But in fact, although this sounds like a tall order to isolate the quantum system nearly perfectly from its surroundings, we've learned how to do it with the idea of quantum error correction. And the key idea is to use entanglement to our advantage. If I want to store a qubit and protect it from the outside world, I can encode it in a state of five qubits in this case in a highly entangled state of the five qubits with the property that if the dragon comes along and makes any observation he wants on one of the five qubits, he won't learn anything about the encoded state. So it's just like that hundred page book. The dragon can't learn anything about the encoded state by looking at the qubits one at a time because the information isn't encoded in the individual qubits, only in the correlations among them. The Beaver can come along and by making clever collective observations of the five qubits detect the error that has occurred, the way the state has been damaged, but the beaver also doesn't learn anything about the encoded state and so is able to reverse the damage without changing the encoded information or modifying it in any way. And that's how quantum error correction works. Now, one of the heroes of the subject of quantum error correction is my Caltech colleague, Alexei Kataev. The day that we first met and I heard his seminar in 1997 was one of the most exciting days of my scientific life because I realized I was hearing from Kataev a potentially transformative idea about quantum error correction. What I learned from Kataev was the connection of quantum error correction to topology. Mathematicians speak of topology, meaning the properties of an object which remain invariant when we smoothly deform the object without ripping or tearing it. And likewise, we would like the way a quantum computer acts on its protected information to remain invariant if we deform the computation by introducing some noise. So we would like to use physical interactions for processing a quantum state, which have topological properties, and physicists have known of such topological interactions for a long time. I know, for example, that if I transport an electron around a magnetic flux tube, its state will change. It will pick up an Harnoff bohm phase. And that phase is a topological property. It occurs, it depends on the magnetic flux trapped inside the flux tube, 
Even though the electron never directly visits the region where the magnetic field is non-zero, and it depends only on the winding number of the electron about the flux tube, it is unchanged if we deform the trajectory without changing the winding number. And we know now, at least mathematically, that for systems in two dimensions, systems that can live on a tabletop, there are very rich potential interactions like the aharna foam interaction, which are topological. These two-dimensional systems can support what we call anions, and anions are particles in two dimensions with the property that if I have many such anions, there are a vast number of ways in which I can glue or fuse the anions together to give, in principle, distinguishable quantum states. But all of those quantum states look the same locally. If I look at the anions one at a time, all the quantum states look alike. The information is encoded in non-local properties concerning how they're fused together as entanglement in the system. And that's just the type of encoding of quantum information that we want to protect against decoherence. And in the case of anions, we can, in addition, modify the quantum state by performing swaps of the positions of the particles, exchanges of the particles in succession, which changes the way the particles are fused together. So we can imagine operating a topological quantum computer, as Kataya envisioned, which we would initialize in a two-dimensional system by creating pairs of these anions. And then to process information, would perform a sequence of exchanges of the particles so that their world lines would trace out a braid in space-time. And to read out a final result would bring the particles together pairwise and observe whether the particles annihilate one another or not. So this way of computing is very appealing because it is intrinsically resistant to decoherence. As long as we keep the temperature low so there are no thermally excited anions diffusing around, and as long as we keep the anions far apart from one another except at the very beginning and the very end, so there's no uncontrolled exchange of quantum numbers between the anions, as long as we execute the right braid, we will get the right answer to our computation. So that at least is a theorist's cartoon of what a topological quantum computation would be. But we need to have physical systems in which we can realize this idea. And there are a variety of proposals about that. One builds on another idea of Kataev, the observation that in a suitable solid state system, it's possible for electrons to, in effect, be divided in half. And this can happen in particular in superconducting quantum wires. Superconducting just means the wire can conduct electricity without any dissipation, without any resistance. But there are two types of superconducting wire, ordinary superconductors and what we call topological superconductors. And at the boundary between the two types, there resides something we call a Majorana of fermion. And if we introduce one additional electron into this segment of topological superconductor, it can in effect dissolve and disappear. And as it does so, the state of the pair of Majorana fermions at the end of the segment changes. But that change is not detectable locally. It's really a collective property of the two Majorana fermions. And if I keep them far enough apart, that information is well concealed from the environment. So here I have two states which locally look the same, the one with the electron added and the one without the electron added, which is a possible way of storing a qubit that's resistant to decoherence. Well, there have been experiments done to try to verify this type of mechanism for storing quantum information. Those experiments are still not fully convincing. Further experiments will be needed to make a really compelling case. But when that happens, I think it will be very interesting, not just as a potential step toward a future technology, but a real milestone in condensed matter physics. Now, if we have such Majorana fermions, can we process them? Well, in fact, we can by performing braiding of the Majorana fermions. Although they live in one-dimensional wires, we can imagine making a network of such wires. And if I want to perform an exchange of two of these particles, I can park one of the Majorana fermions around the corner move the one on the right over to the left, and then unpark the first one. And 
in that way perform an exchange of the particles which changes the stored quantum state if I have a system with many Majorana fermions. So that would be one step in a potential quantum computation used using this encoding method. Now, experiments like this haven't been done yet, but we're hopeful they can be in the next few years. Now, I don't want to give the impression that this exotic topological method is the only possible way of doing quantum computation. So let me uh, briefly tell you about uh, another approach which has been developed by Dave Weinland and others, for which Weinland was recognized with the Nobel Prize, and that is the technology of ion traps. Weinland and others have developed the technology to trap atomic ions using electromagnetic fields and to hold the ions in the trap for a long time. These are just individual atoms with an electron stripped away and you might think since they're single atoms it would be hard to read out the state. But we can imagine that each one of the ions is either in its ground state or some particular long-lived excited state. So we can think of them as balls which are either red or green. And if I want to read out the state I can address the ions with laser light and if I choose the frequency of that light appropriately, the light won't interact at all with the ions which are in the green state, but will repeatedly be absorbed and re-emitted by the ions in the red state, so those ions fluoresce. And I can read off a series of zeros and ones just by observing which ions are shining and which ones stay dark. Of course, we want to do more than just read out. We want to be able to process the information in an ion trap and we can do that because the ions do interact with one another. We have to get them to interact. And in this case, the interaction is due to their electromagnetic repulsion, which means that the vibrations of the ions in the trap have coupled normal modes because of the forces they exert on one another. And so I can point out, pick out one of the ions in the trap and address it with a pulse laser. And if I choose the frequency and duration of that pulse appropriately, Nothing will happen if the ion starts out in the red state, but if it's in the green state, it'll make a transition to the red state and a particular vibrational mode of the ions will be excited in the trap. And then I can pick out another ion in the trap and address it with a pulse laser. And if I choose the frequency and duration of that pulse appropriately, then nothing will happen if the ions are not vibrating, but if they are vibrating, that ion will make a transition transition from red to green and the vibration will halt. So what we've done is we picked out two ions in the trap and if the first one had been in the red state nothing would have happened and if it's in the green state both ions make a transition. So if the first ion starts out in a superposition of red and green we have created an entanglement between the two ions. And you can think of that as one step in a quantum computation that I could conduct in an ion trap. At least this is a theorist version of what happens in an ion trap. But if you actually visit Wineland's lab at NIST in Boulder, Colorado, you get kind of shocked because there's a lot of technical complexity underlying that simple picture that I just sketched for you, which might make it seem daunting to scale up ion trap technology to big systems with many qubits. And it is indeed very hard, but people are thinking seriously about how to do it. There are also alternative ways of realizing quantum hardware. Uh, I'll just quickly mention two of them. One is to use superconducting circuits, not the exotic topological superconductors I mentioned earlier, but just ordinary superconductors. And although for practical reasons this isn't the best way to do it, we can imagine a loop of superconducting wire in which the circuit is either circulating clockwise or counterclockwise corresponding to the two states of a qubit and those states can be put in superposition and what's remarkable about that encoding of a qubit is that the distinction between the two states involves the collective motion of billions of Cooper pairs of electrons and yet it behaves just like a single atom which we can isolate from the environment and manipulate coherently. Another possibility is to use the spin of a single electron in a semiconductor quantum dot. So the electron has a magnetic moment which can be oriented either up or down along some axis corresponding to the two states of the qubit. Those can be created in superposition and manipulated. And that's a remarkable encoding because in this case it's just one electron and yet it can be well isolated and manipulated using current technology. <coughs> 
So in fact, there are a lot of different approaches to building quantum hardware which are under development, some of which I've mentioned and some of which I won't. And it's important that these different alternative paths to coherent quantum processing are being followed because we don't really have a clear understanding yet of which technologies have the best potential for scalability and it may be that hybrids of the different technologies will have important applications. However we build the hardware, even if we use this sneaky topological way of encoding it, we're going to need some form of quantum error correction on top to make sure that the hardware is really sufficiently reliable. And actually the best idea we have for doing that now is however we build our hardware, superconducting circuits, ions, whatever, to simulate the properties of a topological system using that system of qubits in order to get protection against error, storing the information in highly entangled states so that the information is invisible when we look at a small part of the system. But these quantum error correcting codes work effectively only if our hardware is good enough. We have to reach a kind of threshold of accuracy before quantum error correction will make the reliability of the computation even higher. We would like the probability of an error every time we do a two qubit gate with our quantum hardware to be significantly less than 1% to be able to reach very low error rates through quantum error correction with reasonable resources. And the hardware is getting there. Uh, error rates below 1% for two qubit gates have been reported in some of these technologies. But we have a long, long way to, do, to go to, in order to do uh, computations like the ones needed to run um, Shor's factoring algorithm and break public key cryptography. We would like to do computations acting on thousands of logical qubits performing millions of gates and now we're at something like the 10 qubit level and the ability to perform hundreds of gates. But things are progressing steadily and will continue to scale up. It's just going to be a long slog. Now I've been emphasizing three questions about quantum computers. What is a quantum computer good for? Well one thing is we should be able to use a quantum computer or may be able to to simulate any process that occurs in nature, something we can't do with ordinary digital computers. Can we really build one? We don't know of any insurmountable obstacles now that we've understood the principles of quantum error correction. How will we build one? I've mentioned different approaches to realizing quantum hardware which are progressing steadily. And I've thought a lot about these questions over the last 20 years and I think they already make for a compelling research agenda. But I'm not an engineer trying to build machines, I'm really a theoretical physicist. So I'm particularly interested in the ways in which our ideas about quantum computing can impact our thinking regarding other problems in physics. And it's gratifying that in the last few years we've seen many such developments where ideas coming out of thinking about quantum information and quantum computing have been applied to other problems. And many of these applications have to do with what we call the monogamy of quantum correlations. And here's what that means. Classical correlations we might say are polygamous. They can be shared in many ways. Betty and Adam might read the same newspaper, then they have the same information and they become correlated with one another. But nothing prevents Charlie from reading the same newspaper and then he's just as strongly correlated with Betty and with Adam as Adam and Betty are with one another and the rest of us can read the paper and join in the correlation. Quantum entanglement, quantum correlations aren't like that. They're hard to share. So if Betty and Adam are fully entangled with one another, Betty has in a sense used up all her ability to entangle with Adam and then she can't be correlated with Charlie at all. And likewise, if Betty is highly entangled with Charlie, she's used up her ability to entangle with Charlie and can't be correlated with Adam. That's why we say entanglement is monogamous and monogamy can be frustrating. It might be that Betty really wants to entangle with both Adam and Charlie, but she can't increase her entanglement with Charlie unless she sacrifices some of her entanglement with Adam. And this monogamy has many ramifications. It's important in cryptography. It may be that if Adam and Betty can verify that they have a highly entangled state, they can then use their shared entanglement, for example, to generate a secret key that can be used for
secret communication between them. And because they're highly entangled, they can be assured that Charlie isn't correlated with their key at all and can't eavesdrop on their message. It's important in the study of quantum matter because if I have a system of many electrons, each electron might want to entangle with other electrons for energetic reasons. But if an electron entangles with one of the neighboring electrons, that limits its ability to entangle with still others. And so the electrons are frustrated and they relieve that frustration as best they can by finding a particular pattern of entanglement. And we've learned a lot in the last couple of years about how to characterize and classify those different types of entangled quantum matter. And monogamy is even important in black hole physics as has become clearer in the last couple of years. Black holes have been causing great puzzlement to theoretical physicists for the last 40 years. Classically, a black hole is something from which nothing can escape. If an astronaut foolishly enters a black hole, he won't be able to return to the outside or even to send a message to a friend who remains outside. But quantumly, as we've known for 40 years, black holes can radiate and shed their mass. Eventually, we think, evaporating completely and disappearing. And that gives rise to the question, what happens to information that falls into a black hole? Does it get lost forever, or is it restored somehow to the outside world? Now, black holes are like other thermal objects, which radiate thermal radiation. We would expect that the information that the black hole absorbs will be re-emitted, but in some highly scrambled, scrambled, very difficult to read form in the outgoing radiation. But black holes are different from other thermal objects in an important way, because a black hole has an event horizon. And I've tried to indicate that in this diagram on the right, where because of the very highly deformed geometry of the black hole, it's possible to draw a single space-like slice, which I've shown in green, which you can think of as a slice of constant time, which is crossed by the infalling body from which the black hole formed, and also crossed by most of the radiation that's been emitted during the black hole evaporation process. So if the information in the initial collapsing body is encoded in the outgoing radiation, that means that same information is in two places at once, both behind the horizon and outside the horizon. But if it's quantum information, that's very puzzling because that means we've cloned quantum information. The same quantum information is now in two places at once, and cloning is not compatible with the linearity of quantum mechanics. So we're really stuck with a dilemma. Either we have to believe that cloning can occur, or that the microscopic reversibility of quantum dynamics is violated, and information can disappear from the universe forever. Either way, we have to revise quantum mechanics. And in struggling with this dilemma years ago, we developed the idea of black hole complementarity. And the idea is that it's not quite right for deep reasons about quantum gravity that we don't entirely understand yet. It's just not right to think of the outside and the inside of a black hole as two different subsystems of a single system. Rather, we should think of them as two complementary ways of looking at the same physical system. One description is the appropriate one for the observer who stays outside. The other description is the appropriate one for the observer who falls in. But no single observer can come into contact with both copies of the information. So the cloning doesn't really occur in any operational, verifiable sense. And evidence built over the ensuing years that this black hole complementarity idea was on the right track. But then we got kind of a surprise a few years ago through the work of the group known as AMPS. And they said that there's a problem with black hole complementarity. Black hole complementarity seeks to reconcile three ideas, each of which seems reasonable on its own. On the one hand, that black holes can scramble information but never destroy it. On the other hand, an observer who falls into a black hole doesn't notice anything unusual at the moment of horizon crossing, though later on that observer will be destroyed at the singularity deep inside the black hole. And third, that observers who stay outside black holes don't see any unusual violations of the laws of local quantum physics. And what AMPS argued is that it doesn't seem to be consistent for all three of these things to be true. And they asserted that the most conservative resolution of the tension is to relax number two, 
and to say that rather than falling through a black hole horizon without incident, that someone who attempts to fall into a black hole is destroyed immediately right at the horizon in a seething firewall. And that sounds crazy. It's certainly very much at odds with what we find by solving Einstein's classical field equations of gravitation. So why would these smart people propose something so crazy? It's because of the monogamy of entanglement. They understood that if the laws of physics outside a black hole are just the normal laws of local quantum physics, and if the information that falls into a black hole is eventually restored in the outgoing radiation, then that means that in the case of an old black hole that's been radiating for a long time, the radiation being emitted now must be highly entangled with radiation that was emitted a long time ago. And they also understood that if it's true that an observer can fall through the horizon without noticing anything unusual, then the radiation being emitted now should be highly entangled with field modes inside the black hole. And now we have a problem because this system B, the radiation being emitted now, wants to be highly entangled both with system C, the radiation emitted a long time ago, and system A, the modes behind the horizon. And we can't have it both ways because of monogamy of entanglement. So what AMPS proposed was to break the entanglement between B and A and say that the horizon is actually the boundary of space-time. Well, we don't really know if that's the right answer. Probably it's not. We're still confused about this puzzle. And the reason I'm telling you about it is because this puzzle could have arisen 20 years ago, but became, came into sharp focus only a few years ago because only relatively recently have physicists in a variety of areas been revisiting the deep questions that interest them using concepts and developments in quantum information theory. So I think we're still in the early stages of the exploration of a new frontier of physics, what we might call the complexity frontier or entanglement frontier. It is different than the frontiers of short or long distance that we explore in particle physics or cosmology. But like those, very fundamental and very exciting. We're just in this era for the first time developing the capability to build and control precisely very complex quantum systems, systems that are complex enough that we can't simulate them with digital computers, and that opens up opportunities for many new discoveries. At Caltech, we have an Institute for Quantum Information and Matter dedicated to the exploration of this entanglement frontier. And our slogan at Caltech is, Inf nature is subtle. This does homage to Einstein's famous statement that subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. But the truth is that for all his genius, Einstein underestimated the subtlety of nature when he dismissed quantum entanglement as spooky action at a distance. And our aim in quantum information science today is to relish and explore and exploit that glorious subtlety of the quantum world in all its facets and ramifications. Thanks for listening to me. If you wanted to protect against two, two, so if you wanted to protect against arbitrary errors on a pair of qubits, there is a code with 11 physical qubits that does that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, suppose you're wanting to simulate some quantum system with some couple interaction with the quantum computer. Is there a general way to think about the way the size of the computer, the scale of the size of the system? Yeah, so there are results about that. 
if the Hamiltonian is geometrically local for the system that we want to simulate, so if it is um, you know, a, a d-dimensional system in which each one of the qubits is coupled only to the nearby qubits, then the cost of the simulation on a quantum computer for some fixed accuracy grows with the system volume. Um, there, well, there are some slight caveats, but essentially grows like the system volume, the way you would like it to. Whereas classically it's... Uh... Classically it would be exponential. Yeah, so the question is, of course, we know for classical computing for the last 50 years, there's been Moore's Law improvement in processing speed and storage, which is exponential. And so could it be that although quantum computers of the same size with the same clock speed are much more powerful than classical ones, the classical ones will stay ahead indefinitely if Moore's Law continues in effect arbitrarily far into the future. Well, certainly that would, that's a logical possibility. Um, it's, no, no one seriously expects Moore's Law to remain in effect indefinitely into the future, I don't think. Uh, and, of course, it's actually slowing down um, over the last four years or so, notably. The improvements, you probably have noticed it, uh, improvements in storage are continuing and in parallelism, but clock speed has really slowed down a lot. And, of course, there is the ultimate limit of the atomic scale, which is going to be a great challenge for any kind of classical processing. You know, we're already getting to the point where the folks at Intel say are really interested in quantum computing because they don't want to do it, right? Trying to make their devices behave classically on smaller and smaller scales is a greater and greater challenge. But I'm quite confident that for the problems, I mean, you don't have to believe me, but I, I think it's extremely likely that for the problems in which quantum computers have exponential advantages, like simulation of many-body quantum systems, we will, in the 21st century, you know, have quantum computers which far outperform classical ones for solving such problems. Um, so, in a lot of the discussion about, you know, the quantum and classical computers, you think about how the computation scales with the number of operations, and then you imagine some sort of computer with some clock speed, and it doesn't really matter, but the, the notion of the clock speed is kind of arbitrary, and it's uh, not really tied to a physical, you know, time scale. Um, and so I'm not an expert on this, but I, I heard some things that when you try to do compu quantum computations with, uh, with an adiabatic quantum computer, where you have uh, you know, a system that's evolving, that the, that the worry is that the energy levels get very, very, very close together. And then to be able to maintain the computation to be, you know, with no errors, no dragons, that uh, you need to evolve very, very slowly here. And, and, uh, and if that's the case, that's like a real physical wall clock time uh, that points to something very deep about nature's ability to compute <laughs> in some sense. And uh, is that complete rubbish, or it, does it look like there's actually, um, for these hard problems, that you, uh, there might actually be some physical time scale to which the computations can't go back? Okay, so let me try to restate the question. So um, you mentioned in particular the approach called adiabatic quantum computing in which we you know, try to evolve a quantum system sufficiently slowly that it stays in its ground state. And we would expect as the system scales up in size for energy gaps to become smaller, which would mean that to remain adiabatic we would have to slow things down. 
And if, in fact, the gaps got to be exponentially small in the system size, we'd have to go exponentially slowly. And so where is the quantum advantage? I agree with all that. And in fact, uh, that would not be a fault-tolerant approach, a really scalable approach to doing quantum computing. And we don't really have a fully satisfying theory of fault tolerance for that adiabatic approach. But within the gate model, which is what I was basing my discussion on, where the computation can be put in the form of a circuit where we build the circuit out of gates where each gate acts on a pair of qubits, I think we, we understand how to make things scalable and to compute with a fixed probability of error per gate which is independent of system size. And so we can really make the fault tolerance work if we've got accurate enough gates. And accurate enough means some sufficiently good constant accuracy. And then the overhead, there will be some overhead costs for doing quantum error correction, but it is only a power of a logarithm of the size of the computation that we want to do. I don't think there's any, I think people worried about this a lot in the 1990s when the concept of quantum error correction was still being developed and I think there were widely shared concerns that there would be a fundamental limit that would prevent us from doing fault tolerant quantum computing but I think we understand how to do it. Nature has to be a little bit kind in particular, if the errors that occur in our device are very highly correlated, that could screw things up. I mean, there are some obvious ways in which that's the case, like maybe there's going to be a hurricane tomorrow and you know, the whole quantum computer is going to get uh, rained on. But um, we, we understand how if the noise is weak and weakly correlated, we can make things scalable. Yeah. So I'm not sure I heard all of that, but the question is, suppose we have a system uh, with two parts that are not entangled. Do we have some method for entangling them? Uh, that's right. Yeah, so it's very important that the parts are able to interact with one another. If I have a system on uh, Andromeda, you know, and a system here on Earth, which are very distantly separated from one another and they can only communicate classically with one another by sending bits back and forth then we'll never be able to entangle them. So they ha we have to either be able to send quantum information, send qubits uh, from here to there or bring the two halves of the system together to interact in some way as governed by some you know, joint quantum Hamiltonian that acts collectively on both of them. But then if they interact, entanglement is kind of generic, that if you bring together two qubits and you let some two qubit Hamiltonian, which is not just the sum of single qubit Hamiltonians, act on that pair for some specified amount of time, except for a set of measure zero of times, they will become entangled. Generic. Generically, right. Oh, so you were saying entanglement only had the local. Yeah, that's right. So, in other words, classical communication and operations that act locally on A and B are not sufficient for establishing entanglement. We either have to bring them together and get them to interact quantumly, or I've got to send qubits between Alice and Bob. 